we affirm resolve, greed should lead to your result. This is going to be a policy debate. And in terms of our structure, we incorporate our harms, our inherency. So all our stock issues are going to be part of our advantages. So it be a comparative advantage case. Our plan text is that the Greek government would resign its membership as a part of the Eurozone by the end of the summer of 2012 and provide a gradual transition to implement a currency with 70% of the Euro's current value. Again, the Greek government would resign its membership as part of the Eurozone by the end of the summer of 2012 and provide a gradual transition to implement a currency with 70% of the Euro's current value. The time frame will be by the end of the summer. The age of action now should be an issue of implementation and funding by normal means. The value criteria today will be net benefits to Greece and Greece alone. Our first advantage is that this will dramatically reduce the debt. By implementing a weaker currency, we would be reducing the uncertainty in terms of the government being able to pay back its debt. This means that the Greek government can quickly drop its bond prices. What this does is it creates a distortion in the bond market, which means that the aggregate value of these bonds decreases. Basically, when you have a weaker currency, um, when you have a weaker currency, people are less uncertain about the government being able to pay back the debt, meaning that the bond prices are obviously going to be dropped. And since these bond prices are basically dead in the, in the form of financial securities, Greek debt burdens could be ultimately reduced. This obviously is part of our second part of our plan, which implements a currency of 70% of the value. This is the link. And basically, there are four, ma four major impacts we extend. The first impact is that by, except by having lower debt, we're obviously going to have lower interest, interest rates. What lower interest rates does is it, it, what, lower, what high interest rates do is it stymies foreign and private investment, meaning that less people are willing to invest in Greece because they realize it's not because they realize that that, that investment will obviously be put higher, put, put, put higher um, costs. What um, foreign investments and, and private investments does is it, create, it obviously creates jobs and encourages business growth. And this is also a major impact we'll extend later in the, in the speech. The second, um, the second um, impact is that this will reduce political pressure. Because a lot of interest groups, especially in Greece, but not only in Greece, but in, in parts of Europe, they basically spent a lot of money lobbying the Greek government because they realized that the Greek government might, might default. A lot of businesses have a stake in the Greek economy, and they're afraid that if the Greek government does default, then they obviously will lose some part of this. What they're doing is by, by, by paying so much money and lobbyists going to Washington, obviously, there's a lot of corruption going on. There's a lot of inefficiency going on. The Greek government has to deal with a lot of, um, a lot of scandals, a lot of different kinds of uh, bri bribery. These are things that cause a lot of political pressure on, Greek, on, on Greece alone. And are basically our second impact by implementing our plan and affirming today, we're basically um, having less of a reason for these interest groups to come to Greece, obviously because the, the, the chance of default is much less. Um, yeah, sorry, could you just provide a warrant that a weaker currency is more likely to pay off debt? I'm saying the weaker currency means that our overall debt goes down because when you have a weaker currency, there's obviously less uncertainty, right? Because if you have a weaker currency, there's less uncertainty about how, how the currency is going to um, how the currency is going to um, going to play out in the, in the future. Meaning that more people are confident that the government can can pay back. Um, more people are going to be confident about the bond. I'm um, less confident about the bond prices. Meaning that they're not going to invest in bonds as much. Meaning that the price is going to go down because demand goes down. So our third impact is it leads to lower taxes and cuts. Basically, when you have lesser, when you, basically when you have lesser debt, the government has less of a reason to to raise taxes or implement cuts. And especially with the fact that when Greece is part of the eurozone, a lot of the other, other countries want Greece to to perform austerity measures, such as um, austerity measures such as cutting um, job investment and a lot of other kind of programs. By implementing our plan and getting rid of um, being not part of the eurozone, we don't have that kind of outward political pressure being exerted on Greece. And also because the Greek debt is less, you have when you, also because the Greek debt is less, the Greek government isn't forced to make as many cuts necessary to to make to pay back that debt or pay back that deficit. Obviously, when you have um, less taxes and less cuts, you're going to have less protests on the street. It's one of the major reasons why people are really pissed off at the Greek government. That's something I'm going to go into later in my case. The fourth major impact is this will prevent a default. Obviously, when the Greek debt is less, it's a less chance that the Greek, so, uh, the Greek government will be, less, um, be unable to pay back its debt. And also, obviously, a default is bad because uh, what a default does, at least, um, what a default does, it leads to no confidence in the Greek economy, meaning even less. So, extend our first impact, being less investment in the Greek economy because people are less, um, because people are less, are being less investment in the Greek economy because people are more confident about being able to pay back its debt. Our second major advantage is that this will restore Greek competitiveness. What a uh, devaluation, um, what the, um, a weaker currency means is 70% of the euro's value mean. And what, what that means is a devaluation in exchange rate, meaning that the Greek currency is obviously worth less than it used to be, meaning that um, the, the currency is weaker. What that means is it's cheaper to export goods into other countries. It's cheaper for other businesses to buy up, um, for, for Greek to, to sell their currency, basically, and buy up other products. This allows for Greek businesses to get back revenue, to basically make back the loss, a lot of revenue that they lost. The New York Times noted in an article titled The Lesson of Greece that the private sector is the weakest part of the Greece's economy. The fact that the Greek, Greece economy is not only hurt because of debt, but it's also hurt because a lot of businesses are, are afraid to hire. There's a lot of basically hoarding <coughs> going on, and the multiplier effect isn't being um, used properly. Basically, the private sector, is, if we get a lot of the private sector to grow by basically expanding the markets, making it cheaper for other, making it more profitable for other countries to buy up uh, Greek products, and expanding the market, this will obviously be better for the Greek, for Greek businesses. The two major impacts off of this. Obviously, this is going to reinforce or reduce unemployment because when Greek, when Greek businesses are allowed to get more revenue, they have more money to hire. And obviously, they want to hire because they want to expand and they want to expand their business and, and, and make more revenue in the future. So, obviously, provide for long-term economic growth, strengthening the business cycle. Obviously, when business does, does better, this is obviously good for everyone in the, in the economy. So, these two impacts also focus on the economy. Our third advantage is that this will rein in hyperinflation. 
Currently, the Greek National Reserve is artificially printing a lot of money. And the reason why they're printing a lot of money is there's a lot of panic, a lot of uncertainty about what's, going to be, what's happening to the economy in Greece. And when the Greek National Reserve creates money, what it does is it creates a lot of inflation. And basically, what, what you do is, obviously, inflation is bad. But what we do is, by affirming today's resolution, by creating a weaker, unvalued currency, what the Greek, um, what, what the Greek National um, what, what this will do is it will make it literally, literally impossible for the bank to buy up bonds at the destructive rate it is doing. Basically, the, the reward for this is because um, in order to create currency, or in order to print money, as you put it, they have to buy back, they, have, they basically buy back bonds, and the money that they, they use to buy back goes into the economy. So that creates artificial money. But when you make the bond prices less, obviously then the money going into the economy, based on the, the money they print, is obviously less as well. I mean that less money is being inject, artificially injected into the economy, and then you can reduce the hyperinflation by affirming today's resolution. Hyperinflation is one of the worst causes of, of, of the kind of economic in turmoil happening in Greece is one of the worst causes of in terms of in terms of people being riding on the streets. One of the worst causes of families being unable to provide bread and uh, other things in the future. By having a weaker on value, undervalued currency, by affirming today's resolution, you're going to be you're going to be stopping that, those kind of major problems in the status quo. Yeah. So to get this correct, you say that a weak currency is good. What? A weak currency. Yeah, a weak is currency good. is good. Okay. And the fourth, our fourth major advantage, which kind of, kind of builds upon our first advantage, is that this will create jobs and thus even further lower than employment. You can first, the first impact, obviously, you can extend the argument of austerity and how the Eurozone is pushing on Greece to make a lot of cuts and basically a lot of people are going to be out of jobs. The second one, you can extend the interest rates argument about how there's less investment and when there's less investment and there's less debt, obviously there's going to be less jobs. But the third new argument you bring up is that the government can redirect money instead of paying off its debt because the debt is lower. It can redirect that money into investing in jobs. It can invest in public works programs that the Eurozone is not allowing them to do. It can invest in other kinds of jobs creation programs. This obviously, the impact of this is based on the multiplier effects. When more people are, when you invest in jobs, when you're injecting more money into the economy, meaning if someone spends that money, it's created more, it's created more money in the economy. Obviously, that's, that's a, it's a multiplier effect. It keeps going on. And what, what happens at the, at the end of the round is, um, what happens at the end of the day is all this money that's being, that's being injected in the economy can be used, again, to hire more people, more revenue to businesses. For all these reasons, we strongly urge to vote for the program. Our second contention is that there are some interesting legal issues about um, 
the Greece leaving the Eurozone. So basically, the Eurozone has regulations that say if Greece leaves the Eurozone, it also has to leave the European Union. This has some very interesting ramifications, including the fact that on the Eurozone, they have free trade, meaning that Greece has free trade, no tariffs between Greece and any other nation in the Eurozone. If Greece were to leave the Eurozone, it would get rid of these protect or it would get rid of um, this free trade agreement that Greece has with all the other nations in the European Union, which would ultimately be detrimental to trade. And so even if their prices were to be lower because their currency has been um, inflated, because their currency is weaker, at the same time, people in the uh, nations in the European Union are going to buy their goods from Greece because of the tariffs that are erected between Greece and these other European Union nations. Once those tariffs go back into effect because Greece leaves the Eurozone, this is going to be detrimental to our economy. And so the major impact is um, it loses European Union free trade. Once again, would be devastating to their economy. Um, our third uh, disadvantage is a little bit odd, but actually infrastructure changes. It would be very difficult for Greece and its current monetary situation to make all of the infrastructure changes that would be needed to switch um, to a different currency from the euro. So just take into consideration all the vending machines, all the computer programming, uh, parking garages, anything that accepts euros currently in Greece, they'd have to change it to drachmas. That's going to cost a huge amount of money. All of these infrastructure changes, uh, Greece simply can't afford to do that right now. Um, there are also other considerations, infrastructure changes, that must be considered. Uh, Greeks right now, they have European Union passports. They can travel freely between any between Greece and any other European Union nation. This is particularly important for trade because if people from Greece want to trade with other nations, there's now, or European Union nations, there's now going to be all these different logistical issues simply because Greece is no longer part of the European Union. Um, also, they're going to have to uh, border patrol type things because now, um, currently in the European Union, people from any uh, nation in the European Union can go to any other nation in the European Union, but if Greece is no longer part of the European Union, they no longer have this free travel between Greece and any other European Union nation, which would lead to border patrol issues, etc. And um, once again, shipping goods, it's not just monetary barriers that would be erected because of the tariffs between Greece and other European Union nations, but also physical barriers because it would be, be difficult to trade and transport goods. And so uh, with that, I'll read our counter plan text. Our counter plan text is Greece would restructure its debt by lengthening loan maturity dates. So obviously Greece has a problem right now, and our opponents are proposing the way to solve that problem is for Greece to default on its loans and to leave the European Union. However, all Greece really needs to do is restructure its, um, its debt. I'll accept your first point at this time. Thanks. Can you clarify the text for your counter plan? Greece would restructure its debt by lengthening loan maturity dates. Um, so basically, Dr. Murad Chowry, head of the business uh, treasury for the Royal Bank of London, has advocated this idea and has said that really what Greece needs to do right now is not to leave the European Union. This idea has been tossed around um, within Greece, but really what it needs to do is just lengthen these loan maturity dates. Now, once again, if it were to just lengthen these loan maturity dates, it would not link into any of the disadvantages that I brought up. I will now move on and address the affirmative case. So their first contention is that it contorts the Greek market, and basically it would devalue their currency and make their currency much less valuable, let's be fair. How, and they say this is a good thing because it's going to lower the amount of money that Greece has to pay back to its lenders. However, it's ultimately a bad thing for reasons I already kind of touched on. So basically, when the value of a currency is weaker, when the um, when uh, comparatively uh, exchange rates are lower, that means that Greece is not going to be able to sell its goods for as much money. Greece really needs every dollar right now, and when they're not able to sell those goods for as much money, that's going to have um, a huge impact on their economy. And once again, they say that that's a good thing because other nations are going to be buying goods from Greece, but once again, there are no free trade agreements between Greece and these other nations, and therefore European Union nations are going to buy goods manufactured in other European Union nations, not Greece, because there is no free trade. I'm sorry I don't have time for a point at this time. And so basically, actually lowering the currency, devaluing the currency is a terrible idea, and Greece is never going to be able to sell anything to other nations if they ultimately leave the European Union and the Eurozone. And so basically, uh, their first impact is lowering debt. That's not going to happen because Greece isn't going to have this trade that it currently has. Uh, they also talk about reducing political pressure. Uh, Counterplan solves for that. Keep in mind that if they were to extend these loan dates, there isn't going to be as much pressure from foreign nations to get these um, loans paid off. And of course, the European Union is trying to cooperate with Greece right now, you know, they're passing all these scale-out plans. They really do want to help Greece get back on its feet because, of course, their economic features are tied, and so it would reduce that. Um, also, lowering taxes. Greece needs these austerity measures. Well, let's be honest, Greece is in a really bad economic time. If they got rid of these austerity measures, their economy would tank, and it would not prevent default for reasons I've already stated. Once again, second contention, classify the arguments I made about tariffs. They're not going to export goods because of the tariffs. Uh, reigning in hyperinflation. So, basically, they're saying that um, lower uh, 
exchange rates are bad, in the, uh, or good, sorry, and their weaker currency is good. However, hyperinflation causes a weaker currency. So basically, they're contradicting themselves. If they're saying hyperinflation is a good thing, but at the same time, they're saying a weaker currency is good, that's bad. And so for all these reasons, I strongly urge in favor of the negation. Our second advantage on the counter plan is that this kicks a can down the road. It pushes the problem back 
further down the road, and there's no solvency on this. Because again, they give us no real clear solvency as to how their counterplan solves better than our plan. It's some stuff that they kick out of the three disadvantages, which we actually already proved this group, their disadvantages on ours. Uh, their first descent also links back to the counterplan. Uh, going, back, uh, going back on to the uh, on case, so our first on case was that we're actually re reducing the debt, and it's simply said that it reduces every dollar that you have. But, but, but this isn't actually the case. Because for, for example, if we look, they, they try to say that weaker currency is actually bad. If you look, look, look at examples for China, for example, they have a weak currency right now, and they, but they have strong investments right now domestically in China, and they actually have a strong, you know, strong economy as we all know. They're going to overtake the U.S. soon. So what we can see is right now, China, for example, has low, um, has, has a weak currency right now. This is actually empirical evidence of showing as a has how this can actually work in the United States. I'll take a point after I get to uh, on case. I'll take a point. Um, going uh, to our second advantage, we talk about how it's going to restore uh, greed competitiveness, and they simply just, you know. They don't really touch on this at all. They simply said that the counterplan solves the rest of our three, uh, three advantages. But this is not actually you know, true because, first off, their counterplan is uh, illegitimate. And second of all, we actually have uh, this ad on the counterplan that will outweigh any possible, um, I didn't say, uh, uh, um, any possible uh, uh, take out uh, of our se uh, second, third, and fourth uh, uh, advantages that we have. Um, and again, realize that um, that the campaign isn't illegitimate uh, in the first place. Our third uh, third point was about how we talked about rating uh, hyperinflation, and it simply said that uh, that uh, inflation is actually bad. And they simply just uh, they simply spent a few seconds on the third and fourth, so we didn't really get a clear response to these uh, third and fourth advantages. So for these reasons, we can claim that they actually dropped these advantages because they didn't really touch upon them uh, enough. They didn't put enough analysis on them. So just to quickly touch upon um, the fact that their counterplan is illegitimate because, again, it's not competitive with our plan. We're not changing our advocacy here. We're just simply saying that the counterplan is illegitimate in the first place. It's not competitive. And um, uh, but second of all, we actually have this ads that actually link to their counterplan, but our plan actually links to ours. So we can see that we can actually weigh this ads on their counterplan to our um, to the um, to their claim uh, uh, disadvantage to our plan. And I'll take your first question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Could you just repeat the tagline on your second disadvantage on our counterplan? Yeah, the second disadvantage is that um, it kicks the can down the road. You're not, solving, you're not actually solving the problem, you're just moving it and pushing it further down the road. So um, for these reasons, we feel the counterplan is illegitimate because we've, we actually have disadvantages on the counterplan, and because we've actually shown how they've actually somewhat dropped our uh, advantages in the flow, we strongly urge your vote for the affirmation. They, they have this money that Greece has that's not actually there, and they're sort of making it like Greece magically has all this. 
this money stored away that they can invest in all these certain things. And Greece doesn't have this money. The only way Greece can do all the stuff that they want Greece to do, which includes the logistical stuff that I'm going to get into a second, is by getting loans from foreign nations, but it needs good credit to do that, and it needs to be in the Eurozone to get money from Eurozone nations. That's important to consider. Greece doesn't have money. They can't do the things that they want them to do. And all this idea that the bonds are going to magically save the Greece economy, that requires people to buy the bonds in the first place. And nobody's jumping to buy Greek bonds right now because it's not like they're there's a really good guarantee that that money's going to come back to them. Especially if they leave the Eurozone, then there's no guarantee that the money's going to come back to them because Greece's economy is so unstable. So this assumption, this underlying assumption that the bond market is going to save Greece's economy is not a valid one. And because that's basically like what their entire base is going to pay off its loans argument is based off of, you can't evaluate any of that. And so what we can see is Greece is going to have to default on its loans because it will have no other way to do that. If, you pass their, if they pass their plan, Greece has to default. They have no other way to get the money. That's where Christina's warn is coming from. So the disadvantage, all the impacts that she listed out are still there, and they did no work on them. So you don't, don't let them bring up any new impacts in the, in the final speech. The work is done now, so if they try and extend it or bring up any new arguments on this, they can't do that. So essentially, the, the economic collapse coming off of that, all the impacts that we stated in the first place, they still apply, and there's nothing they can do to respond to them in the final speech because that would be bringing up new argumentation. Okay. So moving on from there on to the second, uh, the second disadvantage, that, that is legally problematic. So they talked about the... Uh, actually, you know, this one's not that important, so I'm just going to focus on DA3 right now and get back to that. So, um, the third disadvantage is that of logistics being impossible. So, I really want to talk about this one because this is a big deal. And so, they sort of played this off as not being a big deal. And that it's not going to cost a whole lot of money in the long term, but you have to think of the fact that Greece is literally going to have to restructure all of its infrastructure that is based on accepting the euro. So, these dandy vending machines that we have all across school campuses, all across like America, those things that accept quarters, if we change our currency, every single one of those would be, need to be restructured and replaced to accept the new currency. That's what we're talking about here. And it's not just vending machines, it's computers that need to be reprogrammed, payment machines and parking garages, all across Greece, infrastructure needs to be reshifted, and that's a ton of money that Greece doesn't have, as I already said. Greece doesn't have the money to do all these things that they want to do, and then they're at, I'll get to their advocacies later, but, um, so essentially, they're uh, understating how important that this is, because this is a serious cost, and the money is not there in Greece. It's not like a private, uh, private in, uh, industry in Greece can finance this, because one, the private industry in Greece is not going to get loans from foreign countries in the first place, and the public uh, sector in Greece doesn't have the money, because Greece's government is broke as well, so it's not like they, they have the money to do any of these things that they want to do. And so uh, now I have time to go on to the second disadvantage, so we'll do that. So basically, the legal problems that we talked about. And so we said that Greece is going to be forced to leave the European Union if they leave the Eurozone. And they brought up the example of the United Kingdom, which is part of the, Euro, uh, the European Union, but not part of the Eurozone. And so the, the thing is, is the rule, and by the way, just to give you the source, we were reading this from the European Union Constitution, so I mean, that's where I got it from. Um, but... So the rule is, if you leave the Eurozone, you also have to leave the EU. I don't know what the rule is on getting into the EU in the first place. I didn't read that far into the Constitution because I only had 20 minutes of prep time. But the rule was, if you leave the Eurozone, you also have to leave the EU. That's what we got. Greece is going to have to leave the European Union if they voluntarily decide to leave the EU, or the Eurozone, which is what they want to do. And so all the impacts that they ignored because they just assumed that that was true don't apply, they still are there, you can extend those, I'm sure Christina will blow them up in the next speech, but essentially all the stuff that we talked about, the lack of free trade, is still applicable, and is still a big deal in this round, and you should take that into consideration when you're voting. Okay, um, and that is all I'm gonna do off the case for now, if I really want to, I'll go back to the counter plan later. Uh, so, on case, now, first advantage, the fact that it's easier to pay off the debt when your currency sucks. That's not true. Um, basically, the Greek currency is going to have no per purchasing power because the drachma is going to be worthless, as I've already explained. But basically, this argument rests upon the idea that everybody's going to be jumping to buy bonds because the price of bonds are going to go down. Now, it's true that the price of bonds in Greece are going to go down because the bonds in Greece are worthless. But the reason that the price of bonds are going to go down is, again, because the bonds are worthless. Nobody's going to be jumping to buy the bonds at all. So it's not like there's going to be this huge revenue coming from the bond market, which is what they're saying is like going to spur Greece to pay off all of its loans and or all of its debts, again, no one's going to be jumping to buy the bonds. There's, there's not going to be this huge revenue. And all the impacts that they list, they don't access at all. And they bring up the example of China of having a bad currency, which is a good thing. But China's an incredibly different situa uh, scenario because China has a ton of money, which Greece doesn't have. But more importantly, China has a gigantic manufacturing and industrial sector, while Greece has zilch. Greece's economy is terrible right now. And whereas China has a huge manufacturing and industrial sector, Greece doesn't have any economic might or any economic power. So again, it's compared to totally different situations in two totally different countries. Um, so ultimately on this is the fact that Again, that underlying assumption that bonds are going to save the day in Greece, they need to prove that that's going to actually happen, and they need to prove that people are going to buy bonds. They don't do that. Don't
don't let them bring it up in their next speech because they didn't bring it up before. There's no warrant to that claim. You can't assume that everyone's going to jump to buy Greek bonds. Therefore, they don't solve. Uh, that advantage falls, and that's pretty much the rest of their case because they're going to rely on that. But in case you don't buy that, I'm just going to go into the last sentence pretty quickly. Advantage two, cheaper to export goods. Again, it's more expensive now because we don't have free trade agreements. They assume that that wasn't true because of their argument earlier, but as I've shown, it's not. So again, it's not going to be cheaper to export goods. They say they're going to redirect money to invest in jobs. Greece is broke. They don't have money, and they're not going to get loans because they have terrible credit. There's not going to have it, they're not going to have any money to redirect into jobs because they have no money in the first place. And the fourth thing that they brought up is rain and hyperinflation. As Christina already pointed out, it's contradictory, and I don't understand how they can value that. And then earlier on, say that like weak currency is good. Um, and so, for all these reasons, I urge you to vote for the opposition team today. Thank you. going to begin with voting issues for us, and then I'm just kind of I'm going to compare them to some of the impacts they brought up during the round and explain why you should vote for the negation team. So first off, I'd like to begin by saying that we're keeping the counterplay that that wasn't already obvious, so that's gone. Our advocacy is the status quo. Um, moving on, our first voting issue in this round is that of defaults. Their only response on this argument, as Adam pointed out, is that they actually aren't going to have to default on their loans. But once again, extend our warrant. They're not going to have any money to pay off these loans without the bailouts from the Eurozone. Without these bailouts from the Eurozone, which they would be no longer getting because they're no longer <coughs> part of the Eurozone, there's no way that they're going to be able to pay off these debts. If they're not able to pay off these debts, then they have to default on the debts. That's the link that they said doesn't exist. It's a very clear link. They're going to have to default on their loans. And once again, the huge impact here is the collapse of Greek credit. Now, a lot of their case er, hinges on the fact, essentially, that people are going to want to buy Greek bonds, that people are going to want to invest in Greece. People are not going to want to invest in Greece because their credit rating is so bad. Nobody, if Greece leaves the European Union and defaults on their, all their loans, is going to believe that Greece is going to pay back any of those loans. So once again, not only does this function as a voting issue for us, the credit collapse would be absolutely detrimental economy, and of course that has all sorts of far-reaching impacts. As they brought up in their speeches before, um, riots, etc. are caused in Greece because of bad economic times, and has all sorts of economic ramifications, not only for Greece, but any nation that is a trade partner with Greece. And so basically, defaulting on their loans would destroy the Greek economy. It would lie to a credit collapse, which simply cannot occur if Greece wants to do well. I remind you that the uh, weighing mechanism for this round is net benefits to Greece. This is not net beneficial to Greece. Our second voting issue in this round is that a weak currency is bad. Once again, their entire case is contingent on the fact that a weak currency would be good. They bring up the uh, empiric of China. However, you can't compare Greece's economy to China's economy. China has a huge economy. China has one of the largest manufacturing sectors in the world, if not the largest manufacturing sector in the world. China has money. Greece does not have money. Greece does not have one of the largest manufacturing sectors in the world. And deflating your current or inflating your currency and having a very weak currency only works if you have that very, very large manufacturing sector and extra money. Greece has neither of those two. So one once again, a weak currency is bad. A weak currency is absolutely, once again, going to destroy the Greek economy. Because if Greece has a weak currency, they're no longer going to be able to get any revenue from any other countries because nobody's going to be able to um, want to buy the Greek goods, no more investment in Greece, etc. It's all just very bad for Greece. Once again, huge economic impacts that reach very far. Our third voting issue in this round today is um, tariffs. Once again, their only response to this argument is that if you leave the Eurozone, you don't actually have to leave the European Union. That's not true. If you leave the Eurozone, you have to leave the European Union. They bring up the example of Great Britain. Like we said, we don't know the rules for countries entering the European Union, but not the Eurozone. But if you leave the Eurozone, you're in the Eurozone, you also have to leave the European Union. It's in the European Union, or the Eurozone's constitution. And so basically, this <coughs> argument still stands because that's the only argument they apply to it. There are no longer going to have free trade with any of the European Union nations. And without that free trade, they are not going to be able to sell these goods to other European Union nations because European Union nations are going to buy goods from other European Union nations because they will be less expensive. Even if the drachma is uh, a weaker currency, it's still going to be more expensive to buy goods from Greece because of these trade barriers, these economic barriers. And so now I just kind of like to compare our impacts to some of the impacts they brought up in the round today. And so I'd just really, really like you to take a close look at some of the link stories that they brought up today and the probability that their impacts will actually occur. So just because the price of bonds goes down doesn't
doesn't mean that people will buy bonds. They haven't specified where the buyers for these bonds are coming from. Why would any other nation want to buy Greek bonds if the, their bonds are unlikely to be paid back because Greece's credit ratings are so low? Greece doesn't have a Greek people. The Greek private sector has no money to buy Greek bonds because they have no money. So once again, take a very close look at their link stories when you're looking where to vote. All of their um, impacts, lowering debt, reducing political tech pressure, lowering taxes, this is all contingent on the idea that Greece's economy would get better. But if Greece were to leave the Eurozone, I promise you, Greece's economy would not get better for all of the reasons that we've already outlined. With bad credit, a weak currency, no free trade agreements with other nations, there's no way that their economy could improve. So once again, they can't prevent defaults, they can't um, do all of these reinforcing employment, better business, because Greece's economy would be doing so badly. Um, also, there are arguments about um, reigning in inflation. You can't redirect any of the things that are going on because Greece is broke. They can't get loans because they have terrible credit ratings. And so basically, for all of these reasons, I strongly urge a vote in favor of the negation today. Greece is not going to do any better if they leave the Eurozone, and it is simply impossible to believe so. The link story is extremely unlikely, and the probability of all of their impacts is extremely low. Thank you. why they lose today's debate is very simple. They kick the counterplan. Now what kicking the counterplan entails is that they're shifting their entire advocacy. That means two things. The first is by kicking the counterplan, there's obviously be a real world impact on today's debate. The second is even if we lose that part, even if you don't buy that part, the reason they kick the counterplan is they don't get any solvency on any of our advantages, meaning that debt, everything else is not going to be solved. All the things they point to point about our case being bad, maybe we only get a 0.01% chance of solving, but they get absolutely no solvency. But first, before we get that, let, let me entail what kicking the counterplan does. When you kick the counterplan and you don't argue that conditionality is good, you're basically saying that you're basically saying that you can kick the, you can basically run two counter plans, kick it whenever offense is run on it, which we did put offense on the counter plan. They don't give you any response on why this is so. And because this is my last speech, because they didn't decide to run any kind of theory saying why they can't kick the counter plan, they're going to be losing today's debate. The interpretation is conditionality is bad on counter plans. The, 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 the violation is that if they do kick the counter plan in their, in their speech without providing justification, the standards is the first one is time skew. We spent time in the MGC, um, we spent like at, at least two minutes putting offense on the counter plan. There was offense put on the counter plan. They didn't even respond to the offense. They just said, if you have time, I'm going to kick it. This is, this is the cost of the round. Time skew obviously um, relates to fairness relates to the ground. The second, we had two dissats, by the way. They didn't even address this. Even though the dissats are weak, they didn't put any offense on. They didn't put any um, defense on this. Our second standard, this increases substance to debate. Because when you have a counter plan, and then you kick it, obviously all the flash that should be on the counter plan is gone. That means education is hurt. That's a real world impact. You evaluate this for any de um, debatable impact. The third, um, the third standard is that this is an unfair moving target. Because again, we're spending time trying to review the counter plan. Now they kick this, so our entire next strategy is um, our entire affirmative strategy is basically skewed. We could have been debating. Uh, they could have stuck to the counter plan. We could have debated the counter plan. In fact, if I had a better chance. On winning on the counter plan, but because they, they kicked the counter plan, they get no, because they kicked the counter plan, they're being a moving target. They literally shifted their advocacy in the elbow bar. We spent time, again, we spent time attacking this. They don't, they just kick it. We had offense on it. That's the biggest reason. We had offense on it, and because they just kicked the counter plan with no justification, they lose today's debate. The voting issues, number one, is a priority. Because again, you vote on the conditionality, you vote on theory before you vote on any other um, substance, substantive issues. Because theory has real world impacts. Obviously, you see fairness in education being harmed in today's debate. That has impacts on that. That's real world implications. We come out today, we come out today's debate. And then the people who are listening to this debate comes out with a less of an understanding of what the camp, well, what their account plan actually does, has left a less of an understanding of alternate ways to solve debt. We come out of this debate with something bad. Obviously, by affirming today's resolution, you, you, you basically you're not endorsing the kind of methodology they use. You're not endorsing the kind of I put offense and I can just kick the account plan. You're not endorsing the kind of the kind of basically laziness on their side. Basically, they don't want to respond to certain arguments, so they don't respond to them. You're basically to be a, by affirming today's resolution, you prevent all this from happening. So again, you evaluate, evaluate this on the top of your flow. This is a really easy way to pull the trigger, even if we don't buy conditions which they can't even respond to, so basically you have to buy conditionality, even if you don't respond to this, because they're defending the status quo, even if they can defend the status quo, they lose on all five voting issues. The first one on debt, the first one on debt, we never argued that people are going to, um, the first one on debt, okay, again, maybe we can concede a lot of the waste, but we may only solve 1%, they get 0% solvency. So the, they, you can't even consider anything on the other side, debt is even, not even a relevant issue. We get a small marginal impact um, compared to the advantage on that. 
Second one, on competitiveness, completely dropped. We say that when you devalue the currency, obviously it's, it's cheaper to sell exports. So look at China, it's easier for Chinese exports because it's cheaper when you're a customer in, say, France and you're buying Greek goods. When, when you're paying for that in, in your currency, you can pay, you can buy more money because your money is worth more than Greek currency. So obviously you can, um, it's good for businesses. They, can drop, they drop entire impact about how our businesses obviously is going to grow, how businesses is key to growth. They drop all the impacts on this. The third one, unemployment. They don't spend any time on unemployment. So they give you no analysis on unemployment, extend all the impacts about unemployment means the political pressure. They can see that they can see that protests are going on, but they say something called trade out ways, which we'll be getting into. Unemployment, we went on this, we went on this issue. The fourth one on China. If China empirically proves their entire case to be false, because the reason why China has such a powerful manufacturing sector, or the reason why China is doing so well, is because they devalue the currency. They've been devaluing the currency and having a fluctuating currency since, since at least 20 years. And this is the reason why it makes it cheaper to hire Chinese workers. This is the reason why China is winning. So their entire case is empirically lied. But let's compare the impact. Basically, they have two offenses left. They have leaving the Eurozone. Maybe we can concede this. We can concede the link. So you're blaming trade versus unemployment, protests, and lack of competition. You vote on you vote on our side because a of severity. Unemployment is hurting people directly. They say trade. They say you maybe have to give it to the government and then give it to businesses and then it impacts the people. We directly impact that. On magnitude, you have more people being affected by unemployment. We have we have double digit unemployment in Greece. On trade, this is only a probability. This is something that this is a likelihood of potential harm. See on time frame, unemployment is happening now, 100 percent. Trade, you don't know how long that takes to happen. D, time, trade takes a long time to implement. Anyways, tariffs take a long time to erect. Deal reversibility when you have unemployment. Basically, people are not going to be able to make back the time they lost because they lost their job. On trade, you can always improve trade relations in the future. On reversibility, you vote on hard impacts. On e-moral imperative, because you evaluate unemployment over everything else, people are being directly hurt. You always protect people over the interests of the state and the interests of businesses. If you evaluate infrastructure about how you pay money to switch the switch the coin machines, that doesn't even have any relevance to today's debate. They didn't give you any number on how on the magnitude of that. And I told you that unemployment and protests, which they drop, have a moral imperative because of severity, magnitude, time frame, versatility, and moral imperative that we would be winning on today's debate. So basically at the end of the day, if you don't buy conditionality, which again, there is often put on the counter plan, and they drop it without even a theoretical justification, you're going to be voting the, uh, voting for the form of the plan because it's better than the status quo. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone in this room has a ballot. Yeah, Once you are done judging, please put your last name on that ballot and then turn it into me. And then write Artem on it. <laughs>
Uh, she was part of the uh, Bishop O'Dowd Mira Loma experiment. That did pretty well at this tournament. Um, and that would be Audrey Carson. Um, and the third speaker would be the other half of this uh, duo. I guess as the teams went, you had the highest overall speaks together out of any team at this tournament. It would be Kezra Meklai from Mira Loma. Um, and second place goes to one of the people up here on the, at the front of this room, uh, goes to Saratoga's Justin Chang. And the, one, the individual that would be receiving this fine plaque uh, is Christina Gilbert. All right. And now, um, the important award. Um, there's two awards. This one is for second place here. It's called the Goblet. <laughs> you get to keep it, so you don't have to return it to me. Um, first prize is this year we actually went out and made the California Cup. It is beautiful. It is all metal. Um, it, you know, singular, you know, the California Cup. And here are the name of our two past champions. And so what's going to happen is tonight, today's champion will not take it home. They'll give it back to me and we'll put their name here and send it off to them and they get to keep it for one year. And they have to return it before the next California Cup. Um, we have a 3-2 vote. Um... So we'll go with the floor vote first, as one vote. Um, the floor, all of you in this room, voted uh, 21 to 8 for Saratoga. The four remaining judges voted 3 to 1 for Los Gatos High School, who are the California Cup champions. Saratoga. <laughs> Um, if you want to give your RFDs very quickly, if people want to go home. But if you want to give some of your rationale, why don't we start with the squirrel, Miss McGuinn? That's me. So I actually thought it was fairly narrow, but um, I voted because of the kick counter plan. So that's why I voted with Saratoga. So I think mine was pretty easy because I voted pretty much based on theory, and I thought he did a good job with it. So I'm a squirrel. Yeah, that's oh, this. I voted for Los Gatos because if you want to run theory on a counter plan, you should run it in the beginning, and you should ask if it's conditional. Running theory in the PMC is abusive because they never get a chance PMR. to respond to it. The PMR. Um, and so then if you take, if I don't count the theory, and you should be able to sort of read your judges, because I was like making it very explicit, I was not flowing, like drop my pen and everything. But, so putting that aside, you go on to the flow debate, and it came down really, really narrowly, and you do amazing, amazing impact calculus. The problem is the argument you go for, the unemployment one, is one she responded to and said, Greece needed austerity, and austerity measures are actually good for their economy. And you're extending this line you have about, we're going to reduce political pressure, which allows cutting taxes and increasing spending, but then she tells you that's bad for the economy, and so you're just doing impact calc for her at that point. And... I'll go next. Um, for the theory, I have the same opinion. You should ask if it's conditional or not before you run that, because you even said it in the PMR. They don't have a, respon a, a response to it. They don't have another speech. It's just abusive to me to do that, just as abusive as it is to them. If they kick offense on it, you can go for that offense or maybe come up with a reason in the PMR why they shouldn't be able to do that and why that offense should still matter, but I think that the theory really isn't a question beyond that, because they can't respond to it. Other than that, it comes down to the arguments um, on the flow, and I see some disadvantages, and that's where the, the debate really gets focused for me, and I think that they really take control here, because that's, I don't hear a lot about the advantages, and I hear some impact calculus, but I think that they're going for sort of similar impacts in theirs, because they're going for the economy as well, and I think that they just have a clearer story coming out with better warrants as to why you're hurting the economy, and I feel like they kind of access it more. I just pretty much just bought their arguments better. All right, and most favored critic, <laughs> <laughs> same one. Um, Better be good. Uh, my feedback really is I I didn't buy the theory. I didn't think that kicking the counter plan really detrimented the advocacy of the negative team. I still feel like they proved detriments to the affirmatives plan, and that their detriments outweighed the benefits that you were able to pull through the flow. Those detriments specifically being the tariff that they would still retain, um, not being in the eurozone any, 
or not being in the um, U European Union anymore, and the defaults because of the credit um, rates being so low, those detriments to the affirmative plan, I still felt like despite dropping their counter plan was enough to overcome um, the affirmative's advocacy. Okay. And I think we should give everyone a big hand. <laughs> and, and, like, again, thank you for coming. Las Gatos, congratulations. Saratoga, congratulations. I'll see a bunch of you next weekend in San Francisco. But thank you for an amazing, amazing, amazing tournament.